In this episode of the Think Wildlife podcast, I speak to Neha Singh, the founder of Forest Regeneration and Environmental Sustainability Trust. The organization has worked extensively for the restoration of ecosystems and biodiversity across agricultural landscapes, highways, and urban ecosystems. You need to listen more and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you are listening on. For those who decide to support the podcast through optional paid subscriptions on YouTube or Substack, 30% of the revenue from this episode will be donated to Forest to support all the great work they're doing on ecosystem restoration. Welcome there to the podcast. Thank you, Anish. What was the idea behind Forest Regeneration and Environmental Sustainability Trust? We wanted to create a platform or a, a, a place where we can reach to community and we can you we can work to create a you know place where of coexistence where we see where how we can you know contribute to this conservation what's happening in we have stepped into climate crisis as of now. So how to contribute into this? And I was seeing very less work was being done at grassroots. It was all on, you know, in conferences and we discussed many things, but on grassroots, there were very less changes happening. So I thought, well, let's start something which can work on the very grassroots at the villages and in the forest, in the non-protected areas, and we can reach to directly with these areas of intervention. So we started this organization too. You know, and it's like 10 years and it feels like a very small time, but it has been 10 years since we are into conservation work. Talk about your farmers for bird conservation project. Oh, farmers for, yeah, it was a, initiative in 23 24 we started we only if we see facts only 5% or 5.4% i think area is protected in the form of wildlife sanctuaries or a community reserve or conservation reserve in any form of production so 5% of area so if you think this then 95% of area is non protected area in india so when we see so what and being a tropical country we have very high diversity of species so most of this diversity exists in non-protected areas. So this farmer in for bird conservation is a project which started to integrate protection conservation initiative in non-protected areas. So see, there are villages which are near forest areas. These villages are very critical where conservation or the planning of conservation must happen. So we are working in these villages which are near to forest areas or near to wildlife sanctuaries. And we are interven we are we are doing interventions of which directly of you know which directly help in bird conservation with the involvement of community. So we are training farmers to how we are doing interventions which can help farmers and birds both. So how do you involve community in conservation? That's a project. So see in before, maybe 50 years back or 40 years back, there were trees on the burns, on the farm burns. We have very small hand land holdings in villages and small, small farms. And each farm has boundary. These are farm burns. So now, slowly over the years, these trees on the burns have been disappeared. And these trees were very important. You know, the birds used to sit on these trees, eat insects. So there was uh, this... Coexistence of birds, farmers, trees, there was an ecosystem which was, you know, mutual coexistence. But now with the trees gone, this, this has been broken. So there are many interventions in this project or this program. But first thing we are introducing these trees, which are important for birds, back on the these farms, farm burns. They were purchased which farmers used to install in these farms where, the, you know, it's like a tea where birds can sit and they can hunt for insects, small insects. Again, this is a natural pest management in, in non-protected in farms. But again, with these purchases are slowly gone over the years. We do not see this purchase being installed in farms. 
so we instead you know introducing this purchase back in these villages where we are working there are water holes so we open the taps and we have water but in because rivers are dammed and there are very less flowing water throughout the year in summer season we don't see water on surface so we are creating small water holes for birds so these are all these interventions are intended to create a area where birds can be conserved through community interventions that's a project and we are still running it this is the second year of the project and we will include more interventions in these villages now forest also worked upon the greening of wildlife underpasses in mumbai firstly what is a wildlife underpass and why are they important okay wildlife underpasses so okay if there is a there are two forest areas and animals move all the time or migrate all the time and it can be local migration it can be from one state to another we have political boundaries okay animals don't so they move all the time through these uh, forest areas so these are corridors where animals move and when we we have factories we have roads we have linear developments of railway lines which are coming up all over the country so these infrastructure come through these corridors where animals move so because the corridors are being cut there should be passes which can connect these forest areas so these are known as animal underpasses or wildlife underpasses or oh, it can be underpass or it can be overpass so if there are two forest areas a road going in between so under the road there can be pass which can connect the two forests or there can be pass above the road it's like a over bridge which can connect which can connect these two forests so you know with being a road construction going very fast in india underpass and overpasses should come up equally fast but it's not happening that much so these wildlife areas are being getting disconnected and that's why we are getting seeing you know road kills more and more so when national highway authority of india or the authority which is working on these roads they have the you know authority to create these passes but they are not experts in ecology or wildlife they don't know how what are the great design of these under overpasses and underpasses so in karnala we the karnala there is a wildlife sanctuary in the outskirts of mumbai so we saw the a highway which is goa highway passes from the sanctuary it is cuts the sanctuary into two halves so there is a underpass which is there are six or seven underpasses which have been created but we saw that the art design of underpass was not correct the, the underpass was two or three meter higher from the surface of the forest so if a small animal is coming it cannot reach to underpass so we did the corrections of underpass we created the ramp so the, now the underpass is directly connected to the floor of forest so a ramp connects and now the ramp we planted grasses we put boulders we put so as as see underpass should become a part of forest so animal should feel ki he is just crossing from one area to another it should not feel ki there is a cement structure coming up and so they do though they inhibit they don't cross those structures very often if it is not like a forest area okay they so we corrected the underpass design in karnala wildlife sanctuary uh, we would be working on wildlife crossings wildlife corridors wildlife underpasses so there are projects we would be doing more and more in the designs of these underpasses this is one of my research area i am doing my higher studies in this wildlife crossings and under corridors Why don't you talk about your research a little bit more? Oh, I would love to, Anish. Thank you. So, see again, whenever I'm saying that animals migrate all the time or they move all the time, so these corridors or these underpasses very, very important for the viable population of animals or wild wildlife. So even mongoos, civets, they cannot. See, even if you if you imagine a four lane highway, we cannot cross the highway. Even we cannot cross the highway when we have. We can stop the vehicle. We cannot do this. Any these highways 
speed limit is 100, 100, 200 speed is the limit. So you cannot cross the highway. So how animals will cross the highway? So generally this is road kids. So what I would plan, what I plan to do, uh, so make, make the designs of underpasses and overpasses in Indian conditions. So if there is a grassland or there is a forest, if there is a, you know, deciduous forest, there are different types of forest, there are different types of habitats, different type of, in different regions, what should be the design of these wildlife corridors? So what is happening? And if a road is being constructed, there should be some checklist, at least a basic checklist, which can be seen by even a contractor or layman when, when see, even everywhere, maybe ecological consultant is not there when you are creating an underpass overpass. If the consultant or a expert is there, then the maybe underpass design would be uh, better. But if it's not there, there should be some template which a layman should see, okay, okay, this should be the design of the underpass. I am going to create those. I would like to do this uh, work in maybe in next three, four years, I'll be designing those templates or some designs of overpasses, underpasses in Indian conditions. I'll be through forest, we'll be doing that. So forest is working on a wetland restoration project in Jamshedpur. Can you elaborate on how exactly do you restore a wetland? Yeah, interesting, very interesting. See, it was two, it was COVID times, 2021. It was, it was when Tata reached out to us in Jamshedpur. He, there is a, Tata was creating a biodiversity park. That's a Tata biodiversity park in Jamshedpur. And there's a stream which crosses this biodiversity park. It's a one kilometer stretch. It's a small river. And uh, with uh, small nalas or small streams joining this small river, it is it has become more of a gray water nala, this small river. And this small river joins a very large river at the end of the biodiversity park. The big river is Suvarnarekha River in Jamshedpur. So they, the idea was to treat this small stream, small river before it joins the larger river. So, so any wetland or any, any water, wet, water stream or uh, water pond, water lake, if it is polluted, so the ecological functions which it normally does, it doesn't do whenever it is polluted so maybe storm water or so all the ecological functions were and diminish the ecological system get system the ecosystem get system so to restore these ecological functions of a wetland restoration needs to be done so when a river so what happened when the so many nalas were joining that river the water become polluted slowly the diversity of that river is gone fishes were dying there were no crabs they were so it was decreasing so through the work what we do what we did we treated this stream through various interventions we create so uh, there is a self purification system of river so how a river cleans itself when it flows through area so all that so there are small mechanism you know or there are refills there are ponds there are pools so all this inter or there are maybe a wooden debris which is just lying in the river. All these natural elements create make self river self clean. So we inter we did, did implement all these interventions in a small stream so that river can clean itself. So and by by the end of the treatment, oh, we worked for seven or eight months. By end of the treatment. In seven, eight months, the river water, which is going out, was completely clean. It it was it met all the parameters a water should meet before re reaching a bigger river. So that was the ecological restoration of that stream. And for so this, you know, this restoration can treat any wetland, any if it is a large lake, if it is a large pond. We are working on many wetland restorations across India where we are treating these rivers or streams through, uh, again, the self-cleaning mechanism of these wetlands. So, we are, the various interventions are being done in these wetlands. So, 
the project is come finished now so forest has a habitat restoration project in sanjay gandhi national park which focuses mm-hmm. extensively on the removal of invasive plants so why is the removal of invasive plants from a habitat so important see india has a cost of invasive species second in the if you see global invasive species infestation india is second most you know india bears a cost so invasive species like lantana gladiosidia australian acacia these are invading more and more habitats of india as the habitats are disturbed invasive species just gets in and you know these invasive species they have genetically there it is in their genes to first destroy the soil they don't let other native species come so they so they replace native vegetation they destroy the local biodiversity they degrade soil they degrade water our ground water and the the cause, you know what happens is irreparable damage to the ecosystem so our natural ecosystems are more and more invaded by these invasive species and as invasive species settles in these area the ecological balance is gone and slowly the biodiversity is gone so similar things are happening in many wildlife sanctuary many protected non protected there is happening all over india so similarly at sanjay gandhi national park we observe ki invasive species that species is cromolinia odorata in marathi we call it ranmari so ranmari which kills the ran which kills the forest so it was degrading the forest ecosystem slowly over the years and when we observed it it was almost in 50 or 60 acres of area so and this it was in the area where the you know it's a core area of the forest where the machines cannot go where the humans are not allowed it's a core area for wildlife so because the machines cannot go it has to be a manual work so in the first phase we took a 15 acre of area and we removed the invasive species through manual labor so uh, the cromolina order it or the ranmari was removed from 15 acres and clearing after clearing the invasive species so if you leave the area as it is the next year you will see the invasive species comes in more dense form you know what happens when you uh, you rip out these species when you remove these species the soil get disturbed so whatever the seeds of these species are already in the soil they just get you know they get up and in the next monsoon they will come up with more density so it is very important when you remove the invasive species it is very important to restore this area as soon as you can so after removing the invasive species from sanjay gandhi national park we restored 6500 forest trees shrubs grass so again see restoration is very important what species you are working with so when we are restoring this sanjay gandhi we we went back and we researched what are the original species of this forest we we studied the phd's thesis research papers over a lot of research we found at least 200 species which were found in sanjay gandhi originally so there were 140 species which were decreasing or which were very less in this forest area so all these 139 native trees grasses shrubs again it's a mix of large medium canopy all the trees were restored back and it's a three year project and you would you know it's a wonderful because what we have seen now the impact is very wonderful after one year the whole area almost 15 acres 14.5 acres there was no invasive species which came back so whole area is now you know it is uh, there is no invasive species which is coming up and these forest trees are these are slowly growing up so it's not very fast growth what's happening because these trees came back to this forest area after a long time so whatever moths butterflies bats birds diverse beetles everyone is you know they're eating those leaves shoots so all the leaves we have trees there are saplings which we have planted you see all these are eaten by this me butterflies moths beetles but it is a beautiful area now so trees are 6 or 7 feet high now this 6700 trees 6500 sorry 
trees are growing slowly and for three years we'll be keeping documentation ki how the trees are growing which species are growing slow which species are growing fast so any restoration work it is very important to document what you are doing it is very important to first design perfectly which species should be go there what should be the diversity of that forest and it's very important to document how they are growing which species is behaving differently in that ecosystem so if so for example i would like to see if a moth is found on a specific species we document that ki okay a moth is found on this species so so next year we document it again third year we document it again so is this the food plant for that moth and so next time if we want that moth species in some way if you want to work a diversity of that moth you can plant that species so all the ecological connections we do document in every project in every forest in every area and it is very do- important to document these uh, you know ecological connections to learn and to you know work in better way in next restoration area so this is a three year project so it is in the second year for this and third year will be 2025 and i think we will publish the outcomes or the impact of this project after three years we can we can publish how many species or what happened to this area and how the diversity was restored back talk a bit about the avellamala forest park restoration project in hyderabad the area we work is the vellimala village it is outskirts of hyderabad it is 20 km from the main city or the ring road from hyderabad so again it's a collaborative project of municipal corporation forest department funded by microsoft and implemented by a local partner gamla and we were the implementation partner of this project so there were five collaborating partners and we were the implementing partner so so whatever was happening there is a small reserve forest in that area and that reserve forest was being encroached from all the from all over actually so it was 20 acre of reserve forest and after being encroached it was become 12 acre of area and then microsoft and forest department municipal corporation they decided to conserve this area and we were the implementing partner so we created a microsoft tree park in that 12 acre of it was a it was a scrub land we can say there were rocks boulders they were small to beautiful beautiful wetlands but largely the area was barren and uh, there were maybe 10% vegetation was growing rest of the area was barren is 12 acre there is a temple at the center of this area so and it is a three year project it's still ongoing project for us so the, see in any area if there is a 12 acre 15 acre or 20 acre is a area size like this then we do all the ecological interventions like uh, so there was a first the fence was created for the security so security then there was a bio fence which created it was uh, it was a uh, thorny plants or thorny bushes which were planted all along the boundary as a second line of defense now there was a trench which were created not trench access both as a fire deterrent so if a forest fire happens it will just stop here it will not come inside because of the trench and trench also acts as a um, water percolation pit so rain water get harvested in this trench so again a boundary then bio fence and trench and there were so many intervention like again we removed some invasive species from that area we restored 20000 trees again it's a ecological restoration so again we we did a lot of research we went through the phd research paper findings of the local research universities what what are the species growing there before and again we found uh, around, it was i think around 150 species which were growing in that area and we selected 140 species which we could find and these 140 species again were mix of lar medium canopy shrubs herbs climbers these were all restored back in that area so 20000 plants and total 140 species were restored back there were small wetlands two three small wetlands were created 
there was one metal line which was existing metal line. It was left as it is. So whatever vegetation was there was left as it is. And we just protected that area. So we call, so this is, so active race, this is, uh, we call it inactive restoration. So we are just call, restoring the area. So active restoration was planting the species. Inactive restoration was just leaving the existing vegetation as it is. So it can grow and it can, uh, you know, biodiversity can restore back. And after two years, we are documenting the area and we are documenting the biodiversity. We are documenting everything of that area. And the results are wonderful. The trees are now 30 feet, 40 feet trees. The girth is 20 to 20 centimeter to 50 centimeters. The girth of trees, it's a dense area. It has become a forest. There is a pathway to cross this area. But I'm, you know, a little sad to say that uh, local, some local, mm. some, there's a local activity which is happening. They are creating a road from that center of that area. So it's a 40 feet road which is being created in that area. So part of that area is now destroyed, but it's a beautiful area. So biodiversity is very high, but because of the road lying at the center of that, it is little disturbed as of now. And we are talking with the local authority to, you know, conserve that area. But it happens. So any area, any area of intervention, you have to be, once you get associated, you have to be associated for long. You cannot just, you know, work it and leave it. Any project we take, it has to be for three to five years with us, minimum. We keep it three to five years with us. So we can document, we can protect, we can conserve, and we document everything what is happening. So impact documentation and the changes which is happening in this area over the years. We document everything. Again, uh, to work better in a better way in the next restoration. So that's all the research part. So that's a project at Velimala Hyderabad and uh, funded by Microsoft. Talk about the Aditi Learning Center. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Anisha. Aditi Learning Center is a learning institute. It's in a Kuzgao village near Kamshe. It is uh, 50 kilometers from Pune and Aditi Learning Center is a school for dropout, girls drop out from the villages. They are doing wonderful, most wonderful work at the very grassroots level in around 2022 villages. So we get associated with Aditi Learning Center in 2016, first time we work with Aditi Learning Center. And since then, on and off, we every year we do some project with Aditi Learning Center. It's an 11 acre area. Dry deciduous area or some area scrub and Aditi learning. So till now we have we have worked in biodiversity assessment of Aditi learning center. We have worked for creating conservation consciousness with the students of Aditi learning center. These are the girls which come from the nearby villages, and we have worked with the water interventions. We have created so Aditi learning center is a it is on a slope. And it was it was facing water crisis, you know. So they were if they were depending on water tankers for at least four or five months of the year. And what we did, we did all over the Aditi Learning Center. We did water interventions. We created thirty four bunds across this eleven acres. And over the year, we worked on these water interventions. And I'm happy to, you know, tell you that after 2018, when we did intervention, 17, 18, till now, they are not dependent on tankers. So it is a water sustainable, self-sustainable. Since then, there's a well, which now, which is full of water throughout the year. There's a bore well, which is, which has water. So bore well has been recharged. So it, it is, it is a combination of water interventions and the trees bore. So, see you. Aditi Learning Center is a very good example of non-protected area and which is working on conservation. And it is in a village, village setup. So, it is a model. It's a model for private conservation area. Whoever visits Aditi Learning Center get to know about the conservation in interventions which is which are being done there. So, what we do, see, when we worked with Aditi Learning Center, we we had discussions with uh, teachers, we had discussion with students, we have 
still we do, we have discussions with whoever visits a learning center. It can be nearby villagers, it can be the local community, it can be the watchmen who are appointed there. So we talk with each of them, each of the stakeholders, we can call it, who are, you know, associated with that area. So this consciousness of conservation is now spread across across all these, you know, all these layers, all these verticals, all this community. And everyone who is associated with Adil London Center knows the value of conservation. Till you create that conservation value, the sustainability won't be there. If you, if a person, you know, if they understand the value of conservation, they start protecting it. That's a, you know, that's a automatic response of a person. If they understand, okay, uh, if they understand the value of a river, they start protecting the river. If they, if they understand the value of a tree, which is growing nearby, they start protecting the, the tree. If someone tries to cut it, they want to stop it because they understand the value of the tree. So we we create we we over the years we are doing this as as Aditi Learning Center is one of the centers. So it is our research area. The owner of that of the person who started this is Mary De Souza. She is a she is one of the you know person who motivates us, inspires us. She she consults us. She is one of the one of our. With a very close member of forest forest community forest team, and so every year we do something around a digital learning center or at a digital learning center. This year we are we are doing another another forest nearby or at the digital learning center also. So and uh, we then did a waste management project also. See, we do not work on waste management, but every intervention or every work we do is somehow related with uh, waste management. So we found a forest area and waste was being dumped there. So to protect that forest, we we visited all these seven villages which was which were dumping this waste and uh, we asked the villagers to, you know, can we do something about village waste management? And uh, there was 42 volunteers which came forward to learn waste management. So it was more of a trainer's training project. And we we trained all these 42 people. It was very interesting. You know, we took them, these 42 people, from to railway areas, railway stations. We took them to hospitals where waste was just lying on roads or uh, just dumped in open areas. We took these volunteers to maybe dirty areas where the waste was being dumped. And after visiting all these areas, they understood. They, after, you know, initially they were saying, Ki, okay, the railway is responsible or people, other people are responsible. Hospital is responsible. And after visiting all these areas, after, you know, moving around in a month, there was, this was a process of a month. After a month, they, they started saying, okay, we are responsible. When they understood this, ki, okay, we are responsible for this waste. Then we uh, asked them, ki, can we do something about this waste management? And they said, yes, we would like to understand how we can manage this waste. So then we tra trained these 42 people in composting. And I'm happy to share that till date, they are doing composting. These were students, these were community with people and and. They proudly kept their waste management bins in their front area, in their house, you know, front part of the house. So people should ask you, what is this? And they used to tell other people, they still do that. Ki, okay, this is a waste management, it's a composting, and I'm creating my own waste. And now, so it's a chain reaction which started in 2016, 17, and still chain is going. And slowly... Uh, slowly, it's not a, you know, I, I can say maybe 50, maybe 100 people have started composting in these villages, but still they are doing it. So plastic was also so part, there were two parts of this project. First is composting, home composting, and second is decrease in the usage of polythene. So both are, uh, you know, successful things. They are still, you, all these trainers or the people who were trained, are using less of plastic and doing composting. Now it is almost 100 people who are doing uh, this composting in these areas. So it was started at the Learning Center and 
it is now it's a chain reaction which is happening in villages. So we are working with Aditya Learning Center since last eight years till date. What have been some challenges you have faced at a forest? Okay, what challenges we face? First thing, uh, see, uh, what, see, the vision of forest is uh, how to create this coexistence. You know, we want to see clear rivers, you know, non polluted rivers. We want to see open, green, good wetlands. We want to see corridors, functioning corridors where the wildlife can move. So, see, if, if the challenges we have, First, uh, there are few areas, see, when we, we travel all over India, we, we see wetlands or we see construction funds are required in very interior of villages. But the funders are mostly concentrated in urban areas. So in Hyderabad, Mumbai, Pune or Bangalore, we can find funders easily. But if we want to do a project in, uh, in uh, Buldhana district of Maharashtra, in Lonar, it's a little laid back area, but so for the finding funds in these far areas are little, it's a challenge. That's a challenge we face. And one challenge which I would like to discuss ki, see people from all over India, mail us, call us, ki, they would like to join forest. And but more of more we are finding you know people who want to work in a little, you know, what we call it, uh, non-challenging condition they want to sit on laptops they want they so people are not very ready to work in field day after day so the you know finding the correct people who are very you know committed to conservation so there is a very good way the very very dedicated very strong team but uh, the people who are very ready to work on this uh, finding those correct people is a is a challenging thing and one by one, we are finding those team members. So, as second, I said, keep finding the conservation fund in the very far fetched is a challenge we have. But till so far, it's a very, you know, very beautiful journey, a very impactful journey. We have not, if, if we have a conservation project in mind, most of the time or almost every time, we, we can find a funder for that. So, it's a, been a rewarding journey till date. How, how can individuals contribute to forest? Okay. Again, as I said, our vision is, oh, you know, coexistence, being singless, uh, you know, learn not polluted rivers. We want to see beautiful forest or rich forest with the uh, biodiversity. So if you can I just want to say to every individual, see, as an individual, you should understand ki, uh, what is the value of all this. As an individual, as a part of your community where you are living, as a, maybe you are living in an apartment or any area, as part of your local community, you push them to a conservation goal. You ask them not to, you know, you start composting. Okay, as a as an individual, you start composting. As a community, you should start composting. If you are in a company, you push your company to do conservation-related work. So as an individual, you contribute to that. See, polythene is a curse we have. Okay, every habitat we have, we have beautiful country. And each of the habitat may see forests, waters, everything is just clogged with polythene. And it is all demand and supply. Till we decrease the demand, supply is not going to decrease. So I just want to say stop whatever, at least decrease the demand you have. Every time you go out, you have to take a bag. You have to take a bag. If you don't take a bag, you come back and you take a bag with yourself. So you stop asking for polythene. See, so you can contribute to forest by valuing the trees you have. So I would like to share that. There's a you know, if an animal crosses in front of you, you notice that animal. If a squirrel crosses, you see the squirrel. But if a tree is standing there, we generally overlook that tree. And the term is known as tree blindness. It's a very scientific term. So that is the reason behind people are, you know, they cut trees easily. 
because they don't associate or they don't bond with that tree. So to we thought ki how to connect people with trees. So we started a program known as Tree Ecology Series. Again, in COVID time, we thought ki can we start something because people were sitting at homes, they were using internet more. Can we start something online which can connect people with trees? So the tree, we started a website also, Forest Ecology. It is all the data we have or we are creating or we are documenting through ecological restoration. So data is just shared there. For people to read or go through. So Tree Ecology Series is a series run on this website. And it has uh, the data of Indian native trees. So even if you want to, you know, do plantation. If you want to plant trees in your area, you can go through the website. There are 100 trees. You can make a list and, uh, you know, whenever you're planting, make it as diverse as you can. If you include shrubs, mix of trees, climber small tree, large tree, that mix of mix and match of trees, you know, the diverse species make it as a very rich ecosystem. And then each tree support each other, these different trees support each other. Don't do monocropping, don't do monotype of plantation. There's a blog or there's a write-up I have written, uh, what is the difference between restoration and a plantation? Plantation never becomes a forest. So, so try to, you know, if uh, try to do a restoration, so think about how you can treat soil, water, biodiversity together and how to create a beautiful ecosystem other, rather than planting. Plantation is, you know, five feet apart, you take two or three species and you plant them five, six feet apart. That's a plantation. And it remains plantation. Ever. So if you don't, and you know, biodiversity, it doesn't affect the soil or water, groundwater, I'm saying, or biodiversity much. And if you want to impact all this soil, water, biodiversity, you have to go for a diverse, diverse trees. So take a mix match of 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 species and plant, plant them little dense, in dense way. Maybe a group of 10, 10 trees. Or uh, along the boundary, you are doing uh, plant some dense trees that will support biodiversity, that will store groundwater, that will restore your soil. So, uh, so tree series is there. So, so uh, you know, connect with trees. Talk about trees. Talk about soil. Talk about water in your community. Talk in your uh, wherever you are living. Talk you with your friends. So, if you want to support forests, that's a vision we have. You want to, you have to support that vision. So if you see now the area or the time we are living is, we have very less time to, you know, you know, to conserve this. Now the time is very less and we say stakes are very high. So we are already facing climate crisis. If till we each of us work in this direction, it, we won't be able to stop this climate crisis. In by 2050, if they say key, Half of the biodiversity will be gone. We cannot, uh, we cannot afford this. So I just want to say each of one should, you know, push our community, our families, our companies to work in that direction. Use less plastic, start composting. If you see something which is being wrong, if somebody is dumping waste, if it's somebody, you know, violating the nature, just talk, raise your voice, talk to them, talk to them, Ki, do you know what are you doing? So you cannot do that till you yourself practice that. Once you start practicing and then you can tell other to practice the same things, you know, and read about what's happening in the conservation area, what's how, what's happening in, how you can help in that. So, you know what I'm saying, empower yourself, empower yourself, then you can, raise your voice and do something. I'm a very normal person. When I started forest, I just wanted to, you know, create this ecosystem where I can contribute to conservation. And since then, I am empowering myself to do all this. So if anyone can do that, I just want you to directly raise your voice, walk in that direction, push your community. Practice yourself and then ask others to do that. That's how you can support forest. 
that was the final question i had for you today thank you so much for your time okay anish thank you thank you it was lovely talking to uh, you and the listeners we have reached the end of this episode of the of a thing while the podcast if you are still listening thank you and i hope you enjoyed this podcast and learned something new about conservation feel free to leave your thoughts on the episode i don't forget to share and subscribe before we end the podcast i would like to share another podcast on indian wildlife called the thing about wildlife by ishika ramakrishna also for those who would like to learn more about conservation in india i have attached a link to three books on indian wildlife which i highly recommend one is a field guide to the mammals of india by vivek menon which is by far one of the most detailed field guides i have seen from anywhere in the world the second is titled at the feet of living things written by the various conservationists at the nature conservation foundation it covers 25 years of the organization's research ranging from the conservation of snow leopards in spiti valley to rainforest restoration in anamalai and Dugong Conservation in the Anamana Nicobar Islands. The final is a four-part series by Mr. H.S. Pabla, a former Indian Forest Service officer, which provides a very in-depth analysis of the state of India's conservation and the way forward. It covers species reintroduction, wildlife, tourism, the forest fights, and poaching. He also talks about his I am as an officer heading various conservation projects in Madhya Pradesh, ranging from the reintroduction of parasinga and black buck to the gore and tackling the panna poaching crisis. And with that, we end this episode of Think Wildlife Podcast. Thank you once again.